This evening we want to take up another phase of the problem of the invisible forces around us and within us that can and do affect our more ordinary lives. We have all seen in religious art representations of sanctified persons around whose heads are halos, and we realize that from a very early time, the nimbus, the audio, and the halo have been used to indicate some kind of spiritual emanation flowing from the bodies of very highly spiritualized, or highly regenerated beings. While this um, artistry is reasonably common in the West, it has probably been developed into a more advanced concept among Eastern peoples. I suppose there is no artistry in the world that makes as much of these radiant fields surrounding the human body as Buddhism, especially in Japan. Here we can analyze and study many types of halo. And we discover that these different types are associated with varying degrees of spiritual progress that it is possible to consider them as a more or less exact symbolic language. And many of the designs and ornamentations are very beautiful and uh, wonderfully intricate in their development. The whole concept undoubtedly rises from the belief among ancient peoples that the life force within the human being does radiate out from the body and does surround it with what 19th century mesmerists in Europe referred to as an invisible perspiration, a kind of constant emanation of force, a luminous fur-like radiance. It is possible to exaggerate this by means of high-frequency electricity so that these fields can actually be photographed. Dr. Kilner, in his researches in the hospital in Liverpool, developed his screens by means of which the disease could be diagnosed from the emanation fields of the human body. Paracelsus wrote of them. The Greeks and Latins recorded fables about these mysterious spheres of light within which living creatures moved and existed. We have had a tendency in more recent time to ignore this entire problem, although actually when confronted with reasonable thinking, we are forced to admit that in all probability these energy fields do exist. Even uh, the modern scientist is inclined to regard this matter rather sympathetically. He is quite convinced that man is a center of energy, and there seems no reason to doubt that this energy radiates uh, just as energy will radiate from an electrical device of one kind or another. We have not, however, given much thought to the development of science bearing on this theme. We have assumed that if it exists at all, it is simply part of man's uh, manifold 
Constitution. And this is, of course, the basic viewpoint, but perhaps if these energies were more visible to more people, we would already have considered them in many of the forms of science and medicine which we have gradually developed. Psychology took hold of a phase of this, and we have a, a more or less integrated realization that man does develop mysterious vibratory patterns within himself which may be called complexes. A complex we think of as a fixation or a highly fixed attitude within the individual. Yet underneath everything else, a complex has to be energy. It has to have some kind of a vibratory existence. It has to be a vibratory thing in order to have any power to communicate itself or to sustain itself or to continue its own patterns or consistencies. Unless a thing is constantly nourished in some way, it must fade out or disappear. And complexes have a tendency to build rather than to fade. And we assume now that we are constantly vitalizing them with our own attitudes. What are our attitudes? Attitudes have to be energy. They have to be vibration. And if a complex is fed uh, by attitude, it means that it is nourished by energy. It is sustained by a certain conditioned kind of vibration. Now, what conditions vibration? Why is one vibration different from another? Paracelsus took the attitude that man is capable of influencing vibration by thought. That actually, therefore, human emotions and human uh, mental attitudes uh, really become the creators or become molders of energy. A constructive thought has a rate of vibration of its own. A destructive thought has a rate of vibration. If, therefore, the individual thinks constructively, he supports in constructive ways the energy field of his own body. We are inclined to suspect, therefore, that health has a great deal to do with mental attitude. We know this, we accept it, we affirm it, but we do not try to explain how it operates. We do not know what the relationship is between a good thought and a healthy body. We assume that bad thinking interferes with function, that it depresses, that it makes the nature gloomy. Now what is the difference between a cheerful and a gloomy disposition? The only possible answer to it is a difference of vibration that in one case a certain rate of vibration conveys the impression or carries the energy of a constructive attitude, whereas another carries the energy of a destructive attitude. It was the opinion of the medievals that destructive attitudes created monsters. We don't follow this exactly anymore, but perhaps this is the real mystery of demonism. Perhaps the demon is a thought form. Perhaps it is an emotional intensity form. Something that has a life imparted to it, sustained by the constant support of our own attitudes. In any event, Psychology has come up with the notion that what we used to think of bewitchment was really a problem of fixation, of complexes, of attitudes that became obsessional by constant repetition. 
To be obsessional, an attitude must exercise a powerful influence. To have an influence, it must have energy. And the moral quality of the influence will be determined by the moral quality of the vibration which this particular pattern sets up in the compound nature of ourselves. We also can notice this in other ways. One of the simplest ways of studying vibration, of course, is uh, through some simple form as the snowflake or the frost pictures on a window pane. Uh, these pictures and the forms in the snow crystals show that form or structure crystallizes around energy. Now, we think of forms as all of them visible forms. <laughs> We haven't really gotten to the point where we have accepted the reality of invisible structures in nature. Again, however, if we sit down a little and think it through, we realize that they have to exist. If it were not for invisible structures, visible ones could not come into being. But what we call a visible form must in some way arise from archetype. There has to be some reason why things uh, take on certain appearances. Lavata, the great uh, French physiognomist, uh, used the human face as a symbol of the constant mutation of attitudes and their effect upon the body. He pointed out that the human face is constantly changing in, in, its, in expressions. And then these expressions arise from moods. And these moods, in turn, move out from within the individual as a result of some stimuli uh, which create in him uh, pleasure or displeasure, happiness or misery, uh, friendliness or hatred. But whatever our moods may be, unless we are very skillful in concealing them, they move into almost immediate expression in our appearance. When we are happy, the face brightens, the smile appears. When we are sad, the smile disappears, and a heavy, weary, tiresome look attacks our features. Thus our physical body, especially the face, is forever bearing witness to the internal pressures of our lives. And by the sensitive instrumentality of the nervous system, the vibrations inside of ourselves are communicated uh, to a language of reflexes which uh, creates visible patterns in our features and may also affect the posture of the body, causing us to gesticulate or to take on some curious mannerism. In the same general way, uh, then, we have come through the ages to take it for granted that each person is like a kind of an alchemical bottle containing within himself the compound of his own nature in the form of an energy formula. This energy formula is made up of all of his attitudes, all of his feelings and opinions, all his beliefs and disbeliefs. And because the substance of this mysterious energy field is exceedingly fluidic or volatile, it can change very much more rapidly than the body. Therefore, actually, our moods can change almost instantaneously. And we are capable of causing a, an almost constant commotion within this mysterious alchemical vessel which contains the energies of our lives. Thus, in one moment, this vessel may seem to become radiant with a magnificent, luminous quality. And in the next moment, it may seem to be strangely dark and dull and poisonous looking all depending upon our own moods. Now, we have always had the feeling that moods were things we were entitled to. After all, we can put on a good front to other people 
but we certainly are entitled to have private miseries when we feel like it. If we don't like someone, we may uh, not permit our feelings to be obvious, but it would seem to be a terrible deprivation indeed if we were forbidden a secret animosity uh, when it seems that the occasion justifies. But we do have to realize that there are no secrets in the universe, finally. We can hide things from each other, but we cannot hide completely the mysterious vibratory patterns of our natures. Whether we can see them or not, these patterns exist. Whether we know it or not, these patterns affect us. And they also affect our relationship with other people. They affect us in our relationships with ourselves. So let us imagine for a moment that the average person is surrounded by and existing in a private smog belt. This smog belt is much more difficult and uh, perhaps more dangerous than the smog-ridden atmosphere of our fair city. This smog belt is the result of the pollution of our psychic atmosphere. It means that we are constantly pouring into the etheric field of the body more negation than can be properly neutralized by the operations of universal energy circulation. We are expected to cast off constantly into the magnetic field certain refuse from the body. Also certain exhausted psychic energies are cast off. And with these in turn a fair number of negative vibratory impulses. We are therefore able, as modern science fully realizes, uh, to be unpleasant to a certain degree and still apparently not suffer too much as a result. We can have an, an angry spell once a year or once in several years, and on rare occasions what we term an outburst of righteous indignation and we probably will not have anything worse than a headache or a stomach ache or something of that nature. The body is able to neutralize a considerable amount of negation, even a measure of viciousness. But when it goes too far, when there is too much of a certain quality of destructive energy or destructive thought or destructive emotion, then the magnetic field becomes polluted. When this happens, the person is deprived of a large part of his natural energy resource. He becomes psychically toxic. Now, a psychic toxin is not so different in many ways from a physical one. Both are rates of vibration. But the psychic toxin affects us in our psychic natures, uh, causing attitudes to become increasingly negative and destroying within us uh, the psychic integration that is necessary for normalcy. If, therefore, physical toxins can sicken the body and bring with them, in time, physical disease, psychic toxins can sicken the mind and sicken the emotions and will, if continued, bring on disease in these regions, causing us to be mentally or emotionally sick. And this can be more difficult and more uh, terrible for us than any physical ailment which we may be forced to endure. It's also interesting to realize that our ancient forebears did not limit uh, this magnetic field situation to man, or even to the animals. Experiments, of course, have indicated that it is possible uh, to uh, become aware of the magnetic fields of plants, also of minerals, and that certain gems and stones have very powerful magnetic influence. Paracelsus conceived the possibility of a great magnetic medicine based upon all types of metallurgical compounds 
and various chemicals and drugs, and also uh, to him what we call the vitamin theory was associated with the magnetic and energy fields of living things. In other words, we live, uh, our nutrition is derived not from the bodies of uh, our food elements, but from the energies of them, the, the vibrations that are locked within the physical food elements themselves. This is why, in many instances, vibration is reduced or even destroyed by cooking or by having food stand too long until uh, separated from their sources of life, deterioration and decay set in when they are no longer serviceable to us as was intended. In any event, we can go still further. For the ancients carried uh, the conviction within themselves that there were many different forms of vibration uh, that uh, could be of value or important to us. Pythagoras pointed out that forms, shapes, patterns, designs, dimensions, all have vibratory factors. That the vibration of a cube is different from that of a sphere. And while it is hard for us to realize that such a thing could be true, he was convinced that all forms in nature can only remain as forms because the minute particles that hold these forms together are themselves a living energy. And that therefore these uh, energy elements cause all things, what we call animate or inanimate, to be actually and ultimately alive. Our ancient forebears also were deeply impressed with the aliveness of music. They held definitely that all great musical compositions, all great musical modes, uh, created vibratory patterns in the, in the atmosphere or in the energy fields of nature that music set up vibrations in space, that these vibrations had forms, and these forms united in great symbolic patterns, uh, that uh, the uh, music sounds, uh, the symphonies, the uh, oratorios, the sonatas, and all these things created distinct patterns, that some of these patterns rose like magnificent unfolding flowers in space. Others burst forth in countless designs resembling snowflakes and things of this nature. But everywhere sound produced color and form, and then also locked within it number or mathematical uh, relationships and ratios that these patterns of vibrations developed like the principle of the octave mathematically. That octaves exist not only in sound but in color, in elements, and even in the divisions of races and clans and species of living things. Everything in nature was a vast interrelated vibratory mystery. Man, in his relationship to these other things, might or might not be aware of this. He might have the power to see some of these forms. He might be able to see a high mass in a great cathedral unfolding its, ma its majesty. He might, always, he might also suddenly be aware that in a strange way, the inspired, perhaps, initiated artisans who had created the cathedral had actually captured in the very form of the building a tremendous musical chord, and that the building rose in its spans and arches very much like the music that filled it uh, when some great choral was being produced. These things uh, the ancients sensed or knew. They also realize that whether we can see these different forms or not, we can experience them to some degree. 
We experience them in many ways that we, we do not even realize. Uh, we know, for example, that human relationships are extremely complicated things. That beneath the common meetings and minglings of people, there are strange pressures, antagonisms, antipathies. That some are drawn mysteriously together. Others are violently separated by moods within their own natures. Some people can work together, others cannot. Some can live together. Others find such relationships gradually more and more unendurable. We are constantly also aware of our instinctive suspicions of some people. How the very moment we meet them, we seem to sense there's something wrong. And there are others, almost strangers, for whom we immediately develop a powerful and unexplainable sympathy. All these mysterious examples of psychic chemistry have to be explained by vibration. They have to be part of this mysterious invisible chemistry of energies in which these chemistries meet and mingle, unite and separate, and maintain a strange enduring individuality among themselves even though they may seem to coalesce and actually become one. And the ancients had quite a, a concept of all of this, a sort of invisible chemistry that was something like their alchemy or their divine chemistry, the chemistry of living things rather than the chemistry of physical elements as we have come to think of them in modern chemistry. It has not occurred to us that the struggling elements in the test tube might be in mortal agony. It hasn't occurred to us that any of these strange processes which we see taking place around us might arise from the mixtures of energies, of loves and hates, of fears and hopes, uh, expressed through symbols and patterns which we cannot really tune into. We can only somehow sense their existence. Psychology has given us a certain concept of this, although perhaps an inadequate one up to the present time. It has pointed out, however, definitely that the individual has an internal in which patterns can be set up. That this internal is a sort of room or laboratory where experimentation is constantly taking place. And into this subjective area of our experience, there's constantly flowing the conditioned energies of our attitudes. Here these energies have their own existence, form their own patterns, survive in their own ways, and in many instances complicate our lives and our ways of thinking and living. One other point that may be of interest to bring in is to re uh, remind students of the practices of yoga and the great universe of invisible energies that we find discussed and analyzed in the great early texts of yoga, tantra, and Vedanta. Here we have an invisible world of qualities. This world of qualities has something to do with the redemption of man. And what is this redemption in the terms of Tantra, for example? It is the individual redeeming his own magnetic field. It is the individual purifying his own inner life, performing the mysterious labors of some mystical Hercules. It is this cleansing of the inner life by the setting up, by scientific means, philosophical science or esoteric science, of patterns which neutralize uh, destructive uh, energy uh, fields within the human body. This also, to a large degree, is the true explanation behind Buddhist philosophy for the 
the entire struggle of Buddhism to achieve emancipation, to free the individual from the pressures of ignorance and superstition and fear within himself. Uh, these philosophic disciplines have as their purpose the purification, the quieting, the calming of the struggle of energies within the vibration nature of the highly confused person. Now from these studies we come to some things that are perhaps a little more practical to our present thinking. Let us assume, for example, that an individual has lived what we would term a reasonable life. That is, he has lived uh, within the prescribed area of normalcy. He hasn't been reasonable very often, but he has a fair reputation for it. He is, uh, he is good intentioned, he is kindly disposed, he's no better than he should be, and no worse than those around him. Therefore, he is regarded as highly normal. This situation means that within him is a mass of conflict and confusion, not as bad as it is in some person who is obviously unable to take care of himself. But the so-called average person of today is not internally truly at peace with himself. The vibratory field of his body is made up of miscellaneous energy pressures. Uh, perhaps he has no great outstanding pattern. Uh, there is no real energy uh, design which he is building up purposefully. He hasn't uh, a structure so firmly established within himself that all external attitude is contributing something to it. He has a willy-nilly internal which is supported by the inconsistencies of his external life. He would like to do well, he would like to be kind, he wants to be a person of responsibility. But he has no real dramatic insight. He has no tremendous conviction that is leading him towards any particular well-established uh, point or place or condition for himself. This individual has, for instance, some intemperance. He, he becomes fanatical rather easily. He has strong inclinations politically or socially. He quickly becomes angry, easily jealous, envious upon occasion. Then he is also good-hearted, generous, kind to animals, um, perhaps more so than to people. <laughs> but whatever it is, he has the nice side to himself. Supports all recognized charities. He um, uh, tries to turn in a fair day's work for his wages. Whatever it is, he is just a person. This individual has, therefore, a certain energy resource. He builds up an archetype, whether he knows it or not. This archetype must have a form, it must have a color, it must have a rate of vibration, it must have all of the attributes of living things, because it is a living thing. It is, it is really much more a living thing than his body is. Because whereas the body receives energy by second hand, this energy thing itself at least is supported, is supported by a first hand energy, very close to and immediate to itself. This individual has some kind of a desire to improve, uh, to become a better person. So he begins to set in motion, we'll say, religious instincts. And these religious instincts uh, are of a higher rate of vibration 
than the uh, energy instincts and appetites with which he is most familiar. If he has a reasonably normal outlook on life, he grows a little better. And the energies that he is now sustaining uh, gradually raise the vibratory rate of his inner life. If, however, he becomes too enthusiastic, if he becomes a little fanatical in his quest for spiritual value, he may create a serious conflict in his nature. Buddhism points this out very clearly, that you cannot be the old self and the new self at the same time. Bimi describes it, the German mystic describes it as not being able to be the old Adam and the new Adam at the same time. That if there is too great an inconsistency between our habits, our attitudes, and our convictions, uh, there will be stress. And this stress is liable to endanger our mental and emotional poise. Just as surely as it is difficult for us to live with unpleasant situations around us in family or in business, so it is difficult for the internal person to live in a situation in which parts of its nature are torn in one direction and parts in another. When the psychic field is required to have two allegiances, and these allegiances are not compatible, then there is trouble. So it is quite possible that the person uh, who tries to unfold too rapidly uh, the higher vibratory rates of his nature will get into trouble because these higher vibrations will come into violent conflict with other vibrations that are not so high and not so redeemed in their quality. The person may therefore come not to enlightenment but to sickness. He will find that the vibratory energies that he is developing are too much for his mental focal point. His mind is on one level of energy. He is trying to spiritualize it. And this spiritualizing force is like sending too much current over a wire. It will burn out the circuit. He may find that his emotional ideals are very lofty, but his emotional practices are rather earthy. And here again, the conflict means that the, uh, the body, the psychic organism as we know it, is not able to sustain the exceptional energies that are cast upon it by some resolution of the will. <laughs> It is therefore, as Buddha points out, very important that the individual, first of all, uh, clears the mental, emotional, vibratory field. That before he attempts to put high vibrations into this area, that the vibrations which would be in conflict with it must be cleared by the person himself. He must, therefore, uh, have a house cleaning before he dedicates his life to some nobler pursuit. He cannot try to grow spiritually and nurse all his old faults and failings. He cannot uh, keep on hating and at the same time develop a powerful, constructive regard for deity. He cannot have a deep mystical experience while jealousies and self-centeredness constantly build up negative areas within his own consciousness. If he tries to uh, fight the thing out inside of himself, he breaks the basic rules of Zen and Taoism. He breaks the, uh, the whole concept of discipline as it was set up by the ancient initiate teachers. Well, the purpose of discipline is always purification. The individual in the Platonic and Neoplatonic concepts must first attain a certain catharsis. He must dispose of that which is unworthy in himself. If he does not, 
he will create a situation of combustion in which he will neither be uh, the same person he was before with the reasonable adjustment that made life endurable if not truly enriched and purposeful, nor will he be able to suddenly rise to some great heights of achievement uh, without regard for the fact that the negative vibratory pressures of his attitudes are holding him down. He cannot pull apart. He cannot uh, separate himself. And if he tries to force such a separation, then he is very apt to develop uh, a multiple personality problem and become a psychotic. So that the uh, study of these energy fields and their resources and their contributions to the total picture this study is at least theoretically highly rewarding. It has to do with many uh, values that are important to us. The ancients referred to the magic mirror, and uh, the medieval transcendentalists, those of the early modern French school, spoke of the mystery of the astral light. And uh, this is the same thought that we find in the opera of Parsifal, where Klingsor's magic garden is the symbol of a strange world of fantasy and illusion, a world filled with beautiful flowers around the stem of every flower coiled a deadly serpent. This mysterious world of the astral light has also come down to us in psychology. This mysterious mirror of the sun goddess Amitarasu is uh, uh, preserved for us in the entire mystery of psychic phenomena. So we have to pause here for a moment and give this thought a little consideration. Suppose we say that this mysterious magnetic luminous sphere that surrounds man is this magic mirror that in this magic mirror, man has a strange, uh, uh, unreal, but apparent sovereignty. That this magic mirror is something like the confused legendary of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Here in this magic mirror is a world that has no reality at all, but it is anything we want it to be anything we believe it to be. This magic mirror, this astral light, was so-called the blind alley of the ancient mystics. It was this problem of constant danger of self-delusion. It was a, a condition in which the mysterious power of mind and emotion to create pictures, patterns, designs. Uh, this power, somewhat like the strange fantasies of sleep, by which the psychic pressures of our natures can fill our sleeping experience with dreams and nightmares and strange, vague incidents. This magic mirror within man uh, was not only a problem of visualization, of seeing things. It was a problem of convictions about things. And the simplest explanation that we have of it is that it enables any individual to believe what he wants to believe, experience what he demands to experience, see what he expects, to see and hear that which he intends to hear. Uh, this mysterious energy of illusion, having no substance in itself, fashions all things into the likeness of our hopes and our uh, fears and our beliefs. If we are fearful enough, this mirror suddenly clouds with demoniacal forms, and we can see in this mirror the whole miserable form of hell. If we want to, we can see in this mirror the reflection of ourselves, 
any self we wish to see reflected there. The egotist sees all the vain glory of his own estimation of himself. The wretched see their own wretchedness. The ambitious see the full fruitage of their ambitions. Those who believe in life see life. Those who believe in death see death. Those who believe in anything of any kind can, from the subtle substances of their own imaginings, form justifications for their beliefs. Now, the uh, social implication of this is especially interesting today, for never before, probably, in our history have more people been seeing, sensing, believing, or affirming a wider variety of experiences. <coughs> You hardly meet anyone today who has not dramatic opinions on almost every issue that exists. He never speaks as having opinions. He always speaks of certainties. Everything that we believe is terribly real. And our beliefs are not only fantastically intense, but they shift and change with every passing policy of time. We can be as dogmatic about one subject one day as we were on an entirely different subject the preceding day. We, however, are always sure, we always seem to have the tremendous support of our total nature behind every attitude that we hold, regardless of how absurd or unreasonable it may be. All this terrible attitudinarianism, this tremendous pressure of the uh, irresistibility of our own impulse arises in vibration, and it arises from this mysterious power of energy within ourselves to take upon its own qualities the absolute appearances that we demand of it. This energy is chameleon-like in changing its color constantly. It is proteus-like in presenting a thousand faces. Whatever we demand, expect, require, it is there. And for the person himself, it seems completely valid, absolutely certain, undeniably real. As this situation goes along, we know that it produces all over the world an infinite conflict. Children cannot agree with their parents anymore. Parents cannot agree between themselves. Nations have no common ground. Every law that is passed offends some and is applauded by others. There is no common agreement as to virtue, integrity, beauty, truth or wisdom, each individual or group, sustained by its own strange archetypal intensity, demands that the universe take on the likeness of its own purpose. And in the magic mirror of things, the universe seems to do so. We look into the depths of this mirror, and we see God or no God, according to our own attitude. We see the likeness of deity as personal principle or energy or power, exactly what we demand to see there. This mirror is nothing but our own attitude reflected back, but it seems to present to us a tremendous cosmic reality. Now, this mirror, this strange magic mirror, is always uh, clouded uh, by the shapes and appearances of undisciplined intensities. This is why the ancients warned a man long ago that each individual had to develop a center of integrity. He had to develop a basic philosophy of life a pattern of realities that could not be shaken by opinion. 
He had to have some real and great conviction, a conviction arising in some truth superior to his own thinking. It was only when he was able to discipline his own mind and emotion that he could prevent the shadows from gathering on the magic mirror. The disciplined person will not demand the impossible. Therefore, he will not see the impossible reflected back upon him as a possibility. He will not expect the unreasonable. He will not populate space with false forms or life with false values. And because his own core is not deceived, he will never deceive himself. Self-deceit arises from lack of self-discipline. The individual who has no foundation in values can move from one attitude to another without even the sense of inconsistency. He can live in a strange dream world, and every different dream is a reality. Having no core, having no reality in himself, he is unable to escape the pressure of the common illusion. That is why most ancient mystics, most ancient religious and philosophic groups required of their disciples these periods of purification, this gradual sublimation of intensity. Um, the ancient Oriental mystics taught the individual that while selfishness existed within himself, self-delusion was inevitable. While hate or jealousy or grievances were in himself, truth simply could not exist in him. That no matter how much he learned, he would still deceive himself. No matter how beautiful the doctrines were that he studied, he would gradually corrupt them to meet his own personal prejudices. Or else he would try desperately uh, to be two people. He would try to nurse his prejudices on the one hand and cling to his principles on the other. Out of this would come greater confusion, and usually physical or emotional sickness. So in this mysterious vibratory pattern in which we live, the vibrations of our attitudes paint pictures. They create all kinds of appearances and likenesses. They can lift us up in one instant to heaven and drop us in the next to perdition. And yet actually we have not moved at all. We have only actually changed the focal point of this energy vibration pattern. If we are thus able to constantly pour vibration into this reservoir, it becomes finally certain that it returns to us again as energy problems. Uh, we had noted years ago the very close relationships that exist in history and in natural history between outbursts of human destructiveness and natural cataclysms. We observe with considerable interest that apparently the planet itself can become psychically toxic. We are not sure that we understand the meaning of natural disaster. We always assume in some way that this is the final evidence of dishonesty in nature. That no matter how good we are, no matter how careful we are, who can prevent the tornado? Who can stop the tidal wave? Or who can claim any moral relationships between a community and an earthquake? It seems here that we must accept the doctrine of accidents. Yet if we wish to assume for a moment what is quite reasonable, namely that this earth and uh, 
all of its parts and members, may also be regarded as an entity. This earth is a rate of vibration, and from some other planet we could study its spectrum just as surely as we study the spectrums of Jupiter or Uranus or Neptune. We could thereby learn the energy that it reflects and also discover something of the energy that is inherent in it. We know that planets are sustained by the sun, just as we are. But just as surely as we condition this solar energy to our own peculiar usages, so do planets. A planet as we know it today uh, has a vast energy field of its own. The physical atmosphere corresponds to this physical energy field, and we are now consider uh, considerably uh, perturbed by this pollution of the physical atmosphere of our planet. This pollution is not so different from the pollution of the physical body of an individual. If we pour enough chemicals, enough rubbish, enough uh, material that cannot be absorbed into the body, we will pollute it and destroy it. And if we keep on our present way, we may sometime discover uh, that our personal habits, particularly in various forms of therapy and nutrition, may be a greater danger to us and to our survival than nuclear fission. Actually, the earth itself begins to reveal the tremendous contaminating influence of man's own uncontrolled and unrealistic misuse of natural resources. We begin to see that our streams are polluted, the air is polluted. Gradually, the tremendous increase in population must dump its refuse into the sea or into the air or into the earth. Little by little, the physical resources of the planet are damaged. And lesser divisions such as continents or certain areas of land may be particularly or more immediately affected, just as we can impoverish soil by poor agricultural methods, or corrupt it by the wrong processes of fertilization, so we can uh, destroy uh, the productivity of a planet, uh, of an earth, of a solar system, so far as that is concerned. On this planet there are over three billion human beings whose minds and attitudes are constantly pouring thought and emotion into the vibratory magnetic field of the planet. Most of the vibration that is going into this magnetic field is about as valuable as smog. Uh, the, the best we can say about it is that it isn't quite as bad as it could be, but is getting worse rapidly. Into this mysterious reservoir of magnetic energy, uh, which must also purify itself in the same way that the water and the air and the earth must purify themselves. Into this energy field goes the tremendous, continual, to toxic force of human negation. A world torn and confused, a world selfish and self-centered, a world warlike and dissipated, a world in which, whether we realize it, uh, realize it or not, great units of humanity are united in common negations. Now, we may say that there are thousands of ways of being selfish, but most people practice at least a few of these ways, and the result is that a vast negative selfishness flows out into space as a rate of vibration. Uh, various conspiracies, the fanaticisms of peoples, 
the endless dissatisfactions of masses, the uh, persecuted and the down, uh, downtrodden, uh, all these peoples uh, simply fill space with negative energies. And these negative energies have to be in some way cleansed in order that the great nutritional field of nature be preserved. If there is too much of this, we have the same thing exactly that we have in the physical condition of mankind. If the oceans and the air and the earth cannot purify uh, the waste that is uh, communicated to it or dumped into it, then parts of this waste come back again uh, in the various uh, materials that are used for the continual survival of life. The water is a little contaminated. The air is a little contaminated. And we have to drink that water and breathe that air and we become a little more contaminated then parts of this waste come back again uh, in the various uh, materials that are used for the continual survival of life. The water is a little contaminated. The air is a little contaminated. And we have to drink that water and breathe that air and we become a little more contaminated. The same thing is true of our psychic natures. If the psychic field of our planet is corrupted, if the vibratory energies are polluted, then the human being who has to depend upon these energies for his own survival is receiving into himself vibratory energies that are not pure. Part of Plato's concept of the periodic uh, uh, eras of sterility and fertility in nature, and perhaps is the vibratory answer to the Indian, East Indian concept of the Kala Yuga. Here we have a situation in which we breathe in death, that we take in upon ourselves the final summation of the endless streams of energy that are flowing into this great final reservoir of the Earth's vital supply. If this is not kept clean, if this is not purified, if human beings do not change their own ways, they will ultimately find that this is another form of selfishness, just as suicidal as refusing to curb industries, the fumes and smog and and smoke of which may endanger physical life. Nature apparently finally comes to these impasses in which forms, energy forms, vital forms, etheric forms, what we might almost call demon forms, uh, fashioned out of the very uh, archetypal vibratory cores that we create become like fixations or complexes within our own natures. And these archetypal negation energy patterns can in time produce physical phenomena. Just as surely as, for example, a gradual accumulation of mental and emotional stress within the individual may end in a stroke or a coronary, so in the earth, this gradual building up of psychic tension, psychic stress, may end in the equivalent of this ailment in the body, perhaps an earthquake perhaps a great electric storm, or if the corrupting influences of this psychic situation become too great, a world epidemic, a, a vast plague, a pestilence, or something of that nature. We are beginning to suspect 
a long-range program in sickness. We are beginning to realize that diseases gradually die out as world conditions improve. We are quite convinced, therefore, that while we are taking a great deal of credit uh, for discovering remedies for ailments, that it is not so much the discovery of a remedy for an ailment as it is the correction of a basic weakness in society that finally combats epidemical disease. We know, for example, that in the last hundred years, certain diseases have been reduced markedly. The last five years, we have treated them with specific materials, either by inoculation or something of this nature. And we feel very proud to the, of the fact that we have only a fraction as much of this sickness now as we had a hundred years ago. But let us be thoughtful and realize that the disease had 90% corrected itself before the first inoculation was given. We'll say that in 1860 there were a thousand cases of a certain ailment. In 1960 there were only 20. We take great credit for this. In 1950, the first inoculations were given for this ailment. But in 1940, it had already been reduced to a fragment of its previous rate. So the progress was not made in the last 10 years, but over a gradually improving condition of nutrition, hygiene, levels of human life, strengthening of natural defenses. And it is only... Uh, at the terminal stage that the most spectacular remedies have been applied. It's the same thing in our psychic life. These problems uh, always solve themselves through the gradual correcting of causes. We realize, for example, the terrible uh, uh, influenza epidemic that followed World War I and destroyed more than the war. This undoubtedly was related to a tremendous situation in nature. Statistics have been gathered which would indicate clearly that nearly all of the world's great natural disasters have followed within five years of a great human disaster, have followed after wars, persecutions, intolerances, and corruptions of mankind. So it is quite possible that uh, there is a relationship between so-called natural disaster and the conduct of man, and that this relationship is a valid one, and is another indication of the fact that we cannot live badly and do well. They're just not possible in this universe of which we are a part. In the same general way of approaching this problem, we realize that human beings have either mystically or otherwise have sensed this situation at least to a degree. For into the moral atmosphere of our world has also ascended from the dawn of time the prayers of simple, gentle, contrite, devout persons. Man has sent some way the cleansing power of prayer, of meditation, of thought, of uniting with others of his kind in thought of peace or of help or security or common good. We have sensed always that where many are gathered together in a common thought, this thought has power. It has been used from the beginning of history in the healing of the sick and in other uh, uh, spiritual mysteries. The mystery of ordination, the mystery of consecration and of confirmation, 
are all mysteries in which several gather together to confirm or to confer a blessing. And that this blessing is intensified by the number of those that are present on the occasion. Therefore, where several are gathered together, there is a new sense of strength or virtue or value. This again appears to indicate the power of vibration to build up, uh, to consecrate, or to increase uh, a, a good power, a power for reality. Now we know that in all vibratory matter, everything that exists in nature is essentially good. What we call a bad vibration is not something essentially evil. It is a misuse, an abuse, a false use of energy. It is the individual imposing upon nature an inharmonious pattern, just as we can say that a discord of sound is an injury or an affront to the ears. That the individual, by creating discord, creates pain creates sorrow. Yet we cannot say that the sounds themselves are evil. We must say that in their combination they are evil. Or in the rhythmic patterns that are set up, there is lack of order, or lack of harmony, or, or lack of proper uh, timing or patterning of either energy or sound. So we have the, uh, the distinct realization uh, that what we call negative vibrations are storms set up on the surface of a quiet sea. The inner part of man is not storm-ridden. The moment the individual relaxes away from pressure, he becomes normal. The moment he, no, he does not force the storm to exist, the storm abates. The storm is really man fighting desperately to force a false condition upon himself. And as man himself is a more or less stratified being, we can say that in the core of every human being there is peace that far beneath the surface of the agitation set up by thought and emotion, there are vast depths of calmness uh, where uh, discord or inharmony cannot reach. Therefore, it is essentially the surface of man uh, that is agitated. And by surface, we mean uh, the more superficial of his attitude or the more uh, superficial of his emotions. The individual is disturbed from the outside and from the pressure of externals moving in upon his internal life. Nearly everything has been pointed out in philosophy that disturbs man is traceable to his material situation. In other words, he is selfish. But he is not really honestly selfish because he wants to be wiser or more beautiful or more noble than somebody else. He is selfish because he wants what other people have right here. He is selfish because he wants more possessions, more luxuries. He is selfish because he wants his own opinion to be more important in a world of fools. He is selfish because he is self-centered, and the only self he knows is the one he sees in the physical mirror, not the one he sees in the psychic glass. So his hates are key, uh, keyed to physical things. The people have wronged him here. His political agitations are due to the political parties that are running this world, not some other world. Practically all of his difficulties and his miseries 
are due to the adjustment between himself and the physical world in which he lives. He is neglected, he is forgotten, he is forlorn, he is deserted by his children, he is poor, he is sick, all having to do with physical situations or moral interpretations of them. Once we say only the superficial part of man's nature is moved or stirred uh, by these uh, strange pressures that become psychotic situations in his psyche. To the degree that the individual relaxes away from the highly competitive pressures of material existence, the storms within himself quieten. And when the storms within us cease, and the ocean becomes calm, we can then become aware of the great motions and currents that are in the sea itself. We discover that there are natural laws, natural ways, natural principles, natural energies, natural ebbings and flowings of tides, and that if we unite our resources with these universal motions, we are like the Taoist, who finds in the endless motion of Tao uh, not only the greatest peace, the greatest security, but here the great stream that flows on and on to final unity with truth itself. So uh, the problem is that to relax the pressure of these false values, and this is uh, the key to reducing negative vibratory patterns. Of course, we have made a great emphasis upon the negative because the negative is what is harmful. We have also done it because in the majority of instances, the life is not well enough integrated for the positive to predominate. But it is only fair to point out that every constructive emotion, every constructive thought, becomes the basis of a more beautiful and harmonic pattern within ourselves. That is why we can constantly increase in grace and spiritual virtue. It is perfectly possible for us to build magnificent thought forms magnificent emotion forms of sublime proportions and shapes. It is quite possible for the inner life to be tremendously harmonious, uh, with really nothing there that can shade or shadow our natural peace of soul. We have the perfect right to achieve this. This achievement is not the ultimate. But it is a middle ground. It is the paradiso of Dante, this mysterious realm of semi-terrestrial beauty, which is between earth and heaven. But it is perfectly possible for us to have this paradiso within ourselves. In fact, there is no other place where we can have it. Here we discover that intuition, and the, the more sublime and noble instincts of life create a world of luminous energy forms, that it is perfectly possible for us to create vibratory patterns that overwhelm us with their beauty of form and color and sound and order, that truly like Pythagoras we can hear the music of the spheres and like the great composers can capture out of space the wonderful melodic lines which are going to later develop into symphonies and operas and great works of music. It is perfectly possible for the individual, therefore, to constantly build up uh, creative concepts. And these creative concepts, these great patterns, of creative uh, and inspirational life take the place of the conflicts that we normally suffer from. A complex is nearly always something uh, that 
uh, is complicated, which is the beginning of trouble. A complex has come to mean to us a false attitude. Therefore, we have to now contrast it uh, with conviction, which becomes a constructive attitude. In each of our lives, we are either ruled by complexes or by convictions, either by positive or negative forces within our own consciousness experience. When we create a conviction, we create something of beauty that becomes an inner leader of our lives. A conviction, therefore, uh, becomes a purposeful way of guidance. It inspires us to some continuing nobility or to the advancement of some more sublime value, whereas the complex simply leads us from one difficulty to another that is greater. But we have to have, uh, at our stage of evolution, being the imperfect creatures that we are, we have to have direction. We have to go either up or down. We have to have meaning or no meaning of some way by which we have a contrast of values. We are either living with a good purpose or a bad one. We either have a vision beyond the commonplace or we live without this vision. There has to be these contrasts. And wherever the contrast is a negative one, wherever the negative factor dominates, the life gets worse. Conditions become more oppressive, and the patterns of health and survival are threatened. Another point that has come up in connection with uh, this type of thinking is the possibility of these magnetic fields going to war on each other, or having a strong and powerful influence on each other. We know from psychometry, for example, that when a person walks through a room, a certain amount of their etheric or vibratory energy is left in that room. It remains even for a greater time in objects that have belonged to them. And in primitive magic, and witchcraft, and sorcery, much was made of the importance of the sorcerer possessing something that had belonged to the potential victim, something that contained uh, the energy, or in some way was a magnetic tie by means of which uh, a person at a distance could be reached on the basis of vibration. The concept here being that each living organism has a unique vibratory pattern made up not only of its natural core pattern, which is its spiritual identity, but also the modifications of this pattern by the various attitudes and conditions of life. So there was this belief that there was a means of communication set up, a kind of radio or wireless communication by which it was possible to control or influence anything if we possessed something belonging to that person that contained that person's energy, that person's mana or orenda, the life principle of that person. That is one of the reasons why most primitive people do not want to be photographed. They fear that anyone who possesses their photograph can control them by their likeness, that the appearance of a person can therefore be of the greatest danger if a, another person wishes to use it for magical means. We no longer highly favor this point of view or regard it as essentially valid. Experimentation seems to point out that a very great part of this uh, kind of diabolism is due to the fear that is set up in the heart and mind of the victim. Experience shows, and research shows, and I've done some research in the field myself, that in nearly every instance the victim is told 
in advance are informed in some way that he is about to be assailed. This seems to be the real cause of the damage because he begins to disintegrate from his own fears. And then uh, some Bruhar or witch gains the reputation uh, for having achieved this evil work. But there is one thing that is definitely uh, provable and demonstrable in nature, and that is that these different energy rates do have effect on people, and people affect each other. This is nothing especially esoteric or especially remarkable. It is simply the motion or movement of spheres of over-influence up from one level of life to another. There are a great many people in this world who live for only one reason, and that's to over-influence somebody. Uh, if their advice is not always followed, if they are not allowed to dominate every situation, they're just plain peeved. <laughs> and if they are rebuffed a few times, they become neurotic because they really believe that they were predestined and foreordained to make other people do what they want them to. Also, there are folks who just live for the purpose of being over-influenced. Sometimes it's because they are weak and do not want to make decisions that they have been weakened by early childhood situations. They have not been allowed to grow up. Sometimes they have no desire to grow up. It's much easier to blame other people for your troubles. And anyone who advises you must take the responsibility of what happens to you if you follow the advice. But anyway, this problem of influencing and over-influencing persons, either obviously or subtly, either by open word or action, or by some mysterious subtle process such as auto-suggestion, suggestive therapy, or hypnosis, all these different processes represent degrees by which it is obvious that people can and do influence each other. Probably they shouldn't, but they do. And one thing is obvious, that if parents do not influence children, so much the worse for the child in the majority of cases. So that there are certain influence patterns that are more or less necessary in nature. Psychic influence is not so very different. Individuals can communicate without word or without ordinary uh, means of communication. We can feel the thoughts of other people. Uh, we can be influenced by associations with various types of persons. Uh, we can uh, take on attitudes from other people very subtly, very mysteriously, yet actually very obviously, simply because there is this communication between energy fields. Communication made more subtle by sympathies. Also, there can be cases in which two persons have vibratory cores so similar that they can communicate with each other over considerable distances. There are cases of this recorded uh, in history involving persons strongly attached by emotional bonds and also uh, uh, examples in uh, identical twins, where the uh, one person seemingly, practically, thought with the thoughts of the other person. How to explain some of these things without vibration, uh, without energy, and without some form of telepathy would seem to be rather difficult, but some people are still trying to work it out on a purely physical basis. Actually, there is no reason to question that we do have subtle means of communication, that this communication can move in upon our subconscious just as surely as it can upon our conscious. And we feel that we are greatly at a disadvantage because if it moves in on the subconscious, uh, we are not consciously able to meet it. Uh, we are therefore subject to being uh, adversely affected without our knowledge. This is a, a common belief, and it's a great
convenient to suspect that someone else is ruining our disposition. Uh, it's nicer to feel that than to admit that we're ruining it ourselves, which is usually the fact. But though it is true that we do not have physical means of protecting ourselves from psychic energy, we do have the proper psychic means for protecting ourselves from psychic malpractice of any and all kinds. In other words, this magnetic field, this mysterious auric egg with which we are surrounded, has a complete defensive mechanism of itself. It is like uh, the shining armor of Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. It is a strong defense against any evil that might naturally come to us. Actually, nature has so set up this situation uh, that unless the individual destroys his own defenses, it is practically impossible for him to suffer from psychic malpractice. The only reason he can suffer from it is the same reason that he can suffer from certain physical ailments only if his own energy fields are run down. The greatest uh, promise of health is the maintenance of a healthy body. That is physical health. The greatest pr promise of psychic and emotional and psychological health is the maintenance of a healthy psychic integration. Against this, there is almost nothing that can do any harm. The only way we can get into trouble on the uh, psychic plane is by opening ourselves to trouble by some wrong action of our own. Now, this isn't always a very comforting thought if it's already happened. Perhaps we feel that uh, we were wrong at some point along the way, at least we were foolish, but we have regretted the situation seriously, and uh, we have uh, done everything we could think of to get uh, uh, into a new relationship with this situation, and still it lingers on to perturb us. Therefore, we begin to feel that we are the victims of injustice. We are not the victims of any injustice at all. What we term, perhaps in our way, psychic invasion of our privacy, the possibility that some outside energy is moving in on us, actually calls to our attention only one very simple process. That the only way in which this can happen is that our own proper psychic defenses have not been restored. And that therefore we have to restore them. To say that we can't is to say that we can't stop eating something that makes us sick physically. To say that we just simply cannot make these changes in ourselves that are, that are necessary to restore psychic integration is to assume that we cannot do what is necessary to protect our own lives. If we cannot do these things, then again our own weakness and not the strength of circumstances is the principal problem. I've known many, many instances of so-called claimed psychic invasion of, our, of people's lives. I've never yet found one case where the invasion uh, was major. Uh, it was not a well-planned strategy. The invading force was miserably weak. The only reason it succeeded at all was that the invaded territory was still weaker. The individual was not the victim of some great, big, strong, evil force. He was, in the, he was a victim of something of the proportions of a rat that had found a hole in his psychic integration. The whole situation could only uh, arise from the extraordinary lack of organization of the victim. But the victim, instead of rising to meet the em emergency, simply demoralized infinitely magnified and distorted the whole situation, made a mountain out of a molehill, and frightened himself out of his wits. 
And this so-called influence is going on all the time. Every one of us is constantly uh, a field of vibratory activity and to a measure of vibratory conflict. I don't know how many of you have uh, been entranced or intrigued by the Beatles. This, uh, <laughs> uh, shall we say, uh, Great Britain's revenge for Elvis Presley. <laughs> Actually, for all we know, they may be singing at this moment over some radio station, and the vibration is moving through us right now. But it's not going to bother us much. We're not even going to know it's happening. While we sit here, the air around us is filled with advertisements for shaving lotions, electric razors and constant and repeated warnings that if we fail to use the right shampoo, all our friends will know it. <laughs> what does it mean? Nothing. We're not suffering. Around us at this moment are the thoughts of millions of people. Some of these thoughts are bouncing off of our own magnetic fields, and others are passing through unnoticed. We are constant in a sea of vibration. Vibrations coming from stars so remote that even their light does not reach us as far as our visual powers are concerned. Sounds coming across billions of light years. We can't hear them. But this universe is one absolute network of energies divided into innumerable bands every band filled with vibration in all of its parts. And actually, space is capable of giving us a still greater infinity of bands to be used by every conceivable vibratory length that we can know of now or discover ever in the history of our scientific or um, uh, psychological progress. These things are here all the time. But man, by the very nature of his own structure, is given a wonderful protective mechanism. No matter how many thoughts other people send against us, it doesn't do a thing unless we insist on letting it, forcing ourselves to receive these vibrations that we then turn around and fear. So if the individual follows the simple concepts of Zen and is quiet and relaxed and at peace with life, refusing to combat evil with evil, refusing to acknowledge the right of destructiveness to perturb the natural serenity of the human spirit, these vibrations move right on through. They do not stop unless we capture them by setting up polarities for them in ourselves. The moment we are selfish, all the selfishness of the universe can move in on us because we have set up a pole for this selfishness. The moment we are frightened, all the negative fears of millions of creatures, animate and inanimate, can in some mysterious way find their echoes and their pressures within our own souls. If we are superstitious, all the superstitions of the ages uh, can reach us. But if we are simply controlled, directed, disciplined, integrated people, the only thing that we can receive will be vibration of that quality. The reason why we are open to negation is because of the negation in us. And the only way we can rise above this situation is to transmute this negation into a neutral or natural force which does not attract that which is not desirable. One of the reasons why infinite numbers of vibrations move through us all the time and we do not know it is because these vibrations do not concern us. 
They are not for our use or for our need. Some of them may concern some parts of ourselves. But about these parts of ourselves we may also be completely ignorant. Those vibrations which relate to our spiritual life and our spiritual survival we know nothing about. They are useful to the spirit, but the mind and the emotions cannot capture even their meaning. Therefore, if a vibration is not for us, it doesn't touch us. And it's not for us unless we deserve it. We must deserve it by making the mistakes that bring the negative ones or setting up the positive situations that bring the positive ones. If we do these things correctly, if we build the right polarities within ourselves, we then realize some of the benefits of growth. For it is from discipline and insight and wisdom and understanding that we set up the psychic symbols within our own subconscious which are nourished and fed by the constructive forces of life. If we plant a seed of psychic good in our own souls, nature will nourish that seed and will help it to grow. And we will become gardeners in this psychic garden. And we will do everything we can to make sure that this little psychic plant of beauty grows. We will keep away the weeds. We will see that it is properly trimmed and properly guarded so that it may blossom and fulfill its purpose. And life itself will supply the ultimate energy to make this little plant grow and flower and bear its fruit. Nature will support all that is good. And therefore, if we will plant the right seeds in our psychic nature, they will grow. If, however, we let the psychic nature go to weed, we will have that problem. Not because weeds are bad. Weeds are all right. Weeds are very good, useful things. But they are not good in our psychic lives. They are not good when we are trying to grow something else. And if we neglect the psychic life, it will go to useless weeds, useless as far as we are concerned, because they choke out the life we are attempting to develop. If, however, we do the right thing, create the right internal life, these psychic patterns and vibratory polarities will develop properly. And we will observe the unfoldment of our own psychic lives as magnificent archetypal forms, symphonic in sound, glorious in color, and perfectly mathematical and orderly in design. We will understand that truly this magnificent geometric solid that Plato describes as the human soul. It all depends upon what we do with it. And uh, the whole problem of the so-called negative psychic situation is just part of our experience need. But just as surely as we must learn not to break physical laws if we want to survive in this world, so we must also learn not to break psychic laws if we want to be happy and well-adjusted as psychic beings. We have to earn our happiness in this life and we have to earn our psychic inner happiness through keeping the laws governing the uses of energy and by recognizing that we must be the alchemist, the mystic chemist, and transform the mysterious vibratory patterns of life from base patterns into pure patterns. That we must develop the discriminations and the insight the creative interests, the creative attitudes, the constructive outlets, by means of which we can keep the psychic life happy, keep it normal, keep it growing, keep it beautiful. If we do that, we will have well-adjusted inner lives, and we will build magnificent uh, forms of energy. Instead of complexes, we will truly build magnificent, constructive conviction forms 
that are noble, gracious, and suitable to live with. Then, like the ancestors of the ancient Chinese, we shall live good lives every day, and we shall sleep without disturbing dreams. And these are the laws governing this situation, and if we keep the rules, the rules will keep us. If we break the rules, we will be punished. And this is true just as much of our inner life as it is of our outer circumstances. Well, time is up, so I guess that's all for this evening.